What are the challenges of bringing open source into hardware companies? That's a really good question. Uh, very often hardware companies don't understand or don't do enough software to understand the value of open source. And the business model of open source is something that people don't grok, uh, which is if you give away and everyone uh, gets it, including our competition, why is that such a good thing for us? And so contributions was a big, big area of challenge. Uh, I think most people get consumption, but they don't get the contribution and why we should contribute. Um, the second area, frankly, of uh, bringing open source to a traditionally hardware company is the culture change of uh, how you work in an open source arena, the collaboration, the culture of working with open source, respecting the community norms, uh, listening to the community norms, even in your legal and licensing aspects, you know, was, was a second challenge. And the last one really is sometimes a fear of IP uh, being lost or the intellectual property being, uh, having to give that away or uh, being affected by the way you use a certain license. And, and it's not at all the case. There are many ways to work with open source and still you know, preserve your value and still leverage you know, what open source has to bring. Right, and it was interesting you, you noted the, the difficulty in, in the changing to contributing to the community. What kinds of steps did you take to overcome that? Um, a lot of it was education in terms of why contribution is a good thing and also using business language rather than using the language of it's a good thing to do. Um, yes, it's a good thing to do, but from a business perspective that if there is a certain project that we depend upon or that's strategic to our future as a company or that our products are built on, then it behooves us to be at the table and it behooves us to influence its direction. And the way you influence is by contributing code and to actually um, you know, having your voice heard. And you earn credibility through uh, the involvement and what you contribute. So that became something that people could really understand from a business context that if you needed to influence the direction and be a thought leader in that area, then you need to be at the table and that you need to contribute. Right. And so in the past few years, how has open source's role in enterprise changed and what do you expect to see in the future? There's a very good model I saw somewhere which starts with how most companies start with denial. They believe that there is no open source you know, use in the company. And then they start discovering open source. And then they start moving into the legal frameworks and going into compliance mode. And then they move into, okay, I acknowledge that we are using open source and we need to understand where we are using it and how we are using it and make sure that we use it smartly and also work with our community from that perspective. And then they move into contribution and then they become very adept at um, actually uh, working with the community, working collaboratively with other companies to change industries, to change uh, you know, how things are done. Um, some of the things that are happening just now and going into the future will be inner source, which is how companies are actually reorganizing how engineering is done inside companies so that it mimics more of an open source model. It breaks down the silos and the walls across different divisions. It actually allows people to contribute to projects across the company, uh, which, which people want to do. And it allows you to empower people to uh, really become full stack experts rather than just be an expert at their own component. That's an interesting concept, the internal open source sort of, that's, uh, that's excellent. That's right. What would you say is the biggest challenge you're facing today? I still face the challenge of um, engineering managers, the middle managers especially, finding or making time in their schedules for people to not just use open source but to contribute back any changes they made, uh, to allow their people time to do open source work or to go to conferences or to speak at conferences or to really participate in open source in a meaningful way. 
Uh, I think middle managers are, I can understand, I mean, they're under pressure to deliver products on time and to also get work done. And uh, so they tend not to allow for any uh, extraneous activity to uh, be included. And, and the way around this is, is twofold. One is changing the reward system so that they can be rewarded for open source contributions and participation just as much as getting the products done. And second is uh, some companies have chosen to really carve out resources and firewall them off from product resources so that they can go do open source work. Um, because product will always uh, win over in the end. Um, but if you have a carved out team that's doing more proactive, mainline uh, type of work, then the, in the entire company benefits. And so that's the biggest challenge I face, is, is finding time to do this work. Right. And changing directions just a little bit, um, you've got to talk about marketing in open source. Why does marketing tend to be taboo in open source? And what kind of advice would you offer open source entrepreneurs? Marketing tends to be a taboo uh, because either it's complex to understand um, or uh, code is king. And very often people think once they finish coding, you know, code speaks for itself. I don't have to explain it to anyone. And if I build, they will come. And then they discover that the project doesn't take off. There isn't uh, much involvement and the project either dies or uh, you know, there's very little adoption. And it's, it's a pity because there are some really, really good projects out there and with a few basic things that people can do, uh, you can really uh, attract and uh, get, achieve the goals that you want. And most um, open source entrepreneurs want to A, attract more users to their projects because they think there's someone else who has the same itch and second, they want people to start then contributing and getting involved and, and growing the project. And third, they often are looking for funders who can fund some of the infrastructure needs of the project and you know allow the project to scale. Um, and to do that, it really takes a few simple steps. If you can sit down and understand and articulate what problem am I trying to solve and what is my solution to this problem, and what, what makes it unique? And who cares about the solution? And then how do I reach that person? If you can write this down, and you can easily find an English major or someone in your team or get a volunteer who can help you, you know, put your story together. It's, it's storytelling that's, what, that's needed. Then you can easily take that story to meetups, you can take it to events, you can take it to social media, you can uh, put it, uh, convert it into a logo for your product and, and your product name, but it really starts with getting your story together on problem, solution, unique value proposition, and your audience. All right, and so last question for you. What people or projects are you following? What are you finding personally interesting these days? Um, there's a very interesting little company which also open sources a lot of the work that they do called Betergia and a Spain-based company. They do open source analytics. They slice and dice you know, contributions, code reviews uh, for OpenStack and for lots of other uh, projects. And they did some really interesting work for us uh, for the women of OpenStack. Um, they analyzed you know, where women are contributing, how contributions are growing over the years. And it was really gratifying to see that 10% you know, of the commits in OpenStack were coming from women and that they were doing a lot of code reviews. Um, they really uh, were leaders in documentation and UI and uh, things of that sort. So it allowed us to um, really s deliver some sound metrics um, and to see where we grow the community from there. A Couple of other interesting projects from a SanDisk perspective for me, being a data company, Ceph is very interesting because of its scale-out object-oriented architecture. Uh, we use Ceph and we work with the Ceph community. Um, the whole Hadoop and Spark ecosystem is very interesting to me um, because data has become such an, a big asset and uh, delivering insight from data in a very fast way is what Flash does. And so that becomes very interesting to me. 
Well, excellent. Thank you very much for talking with me today. It's been fun. Thanks, Jen.